Thanks, Pete. Hi, everybody. My name is Jamie, and I'm a solution engineer here at HashiCorp. Today, I'm going to be talking about a common approach to deploying applications called blue-green deployments. The reason I've chosen to talk about this today is because an organization's ability to stay competitive is so tightly coupled to their ability to efficiently release code, any tool that can improve upon that process is worth paying close attention to. So today, I'm going to show you how Console can help you release new versions of your applications while maintaining a high level of confidence and accuracy, all while keeping a bulletproof rollback option. So what is a blue-green deployment anyway? In its simplest form, all we're talking about is making a decision to stop sending traffic somewhere and to start sending traffic somewhere else. Here, I've got my users on the left-hand side, and they're all accessing my application over here on the right via some kind of network load balancer. At some point, we need to deploy a new version of our application. So we're going to start by standing it up right next to version one. Here, once we've done enough testing and we're happy with the release, we're going to schedule a maintenance window and someone makes that decision to flick the switch. We move all of our users' traffic over to the new version of our service. And the benefit of this approach, other than its raw simplicity, is that we always maintain this rock solid fallback model, whereby if anything does go wrong, we've got a known working version that we're ready to divert traffic back to if we so need to. But in this case, let's say nothing does go wrong. I'm happy with the experience that my users are getting and the change hasn't caused any sort of obvious errors. So we can move on, deprovision the version of our old application, and then the process is complete. We can start all over again for the next release. And this, as lifecycle events go, is about as simple as it gets. So now we've got an understanding of how blue-green deployments are supposed to work. Let's take a look at where you might use this pattern today. And the first one is the most obvious one, and that's upgrading from one version of an application to another. This is usually what comes right to front of mind when people first talk about blue-green deployments. The second one is migrating my application from one platform to another. Here, I might not necessarily be changing the version of my application, but I still need to enact this switching of traffic from one deployment to the next. And then finally, disaster recovery. Often not front of mind when people first think of blue-green deployments, but actually this act of directing all my traffic from one deployment to another is exactly the same as something that we might do during a DR scenario. So although these events are normally thought of quite differently, in reality, what we're asking of our network is essentially the same thing. At some point, we need to make that decision to stop sending traffic somewhere and to start sending it somewhere else. And ideally, we want to do all of this in a way that is as least disruptive to our users as possible. So let's take a closer look at what using this deployment pattern might look like in a more realistic scenario. The scenario that I'm going to talk about today is the scenario of these three that we get asked about most frequently here at HashiCorp. And that is, how do I use this approach to help me in my cloud migrations? So this time we're gonna be using that same blue-green deployment pattern that we've just seen. But now I'm gonna zoom in a bit and try to understand where this approach might start to become quite complicated. So here I have my application deployed in my private data center. And I've been given the mandate by my organization to migrate to the public cloud. So we start off by doing what any good cloud engineer would do, and that is to look at what components make up our application. Here, the most common thing that we find is that our application has been built up in some form of service-oriented architecture. Maybe I'm not using full-blown microservices, but they are discrete, separate subcomponents that all together make up my application. And then finally, what we typically find, particularly from our enterprise customers, is that these applications have been built up over many years and all of these smaller components can be deployed on different platforms altogether. So now we've got a better understanding of what makes up my application. Let's try and use a blue-green deployment to help us migrate this to the cloud. The first, and probably the most obvious approach to doing a cloud migration is what I've called here the big bang. My approach is gonna to be to stand up a one-for-one -one exact replica of my production system into the cloud. I'm going to start off by provisioning my platforms. Maybe I choose EC2 and EKS. And then one by one, I'll move over each service 
doing various testings as I go. And then I'll schedule that same maintenance window. And at some point, I'll make the decision to send traffic from one service to the next. Everything's going to be fine, right? Wrong. Some things went wrong in the new environment. I don't know exactly what's gone wrong, but I do know it's over there in the public cloud. The problem here is just because I moved my application to a more modern platform, I didn't necessarily gain any more visibility in terms of how it operates. So whether it's because the engineer that built it is no longer here anymore, or whether it's because the application is just so heavily integrated into different parts of my organization, inevitably, I've forgotten something. Somewhere in the chaos, I've neglected to move over a single dependency. Maybe I'm using the wrong credential for a third-party API. Maybe I'm missing a firewall rule for a network flow that I just didn't know existed. Or maybe I've overlooked how something I do on-premise just doesn't work the same in the cloud. But that's okay, because I've still got my rock-solid fallback model. I can just flick my switch and send all my traffic back to my known working version. It's going to take a few minutes, but the alerts will stop. My users are no longer seeing errors, and everything calms back down. Me and my team regroup for an attempt another day. But at this point, the damage has probably already been done. My users may well be already considering my competition and maybe my own team's reputation has been damaged inside of our organization. Either way, the obvious next thing to do is to turn it all off and pretend it didn't happen. So I start, I deprovision everything that I built in the public cloud. And then I, I go back to the business and I tell them, unfortunately, a cloud migration is not going to schedule. Maybe I tell them it's technically too challenging or I tell them we just haven't got enough resources. Either way, we've missed the deadline. And if any of this is sounding familiar to you, then rest assured you're not alone. In fact, the story that I've just told you is really an anonymized version of the same story that I've heard from a number of enterprises. And the reason is cloud migrations are really complex. But what if I could tell you there was a better way? What if I could take a far more pragmatic approach to my migration? What if instead of doing a big bang, I could break down my migration into a smaller number of manageable steps, validating as we go? Let's take a look at what that might look like. I would start off the same provisioning my platforms, and then I would choose just a single service to move over first. Once I'm happy that I've done enough testing, I might start to move some traffic over. I might start incrementally, only sending a subset of my traffic to the new service, and then once I've gained some confidence, I'll make the switch completely, sending all my traffic to the new deployment. At some point, I'll be happy with the change and I'll deprovision my old service. And wouldn't it be great if we could do all of this in a way that is completely agnostic to the platform that it's running on? I don't wanna make a technology choice today that's gonna limit me down the track. I want whatever tooling that I choose to support virtual machines, containers, whichever orchestrator or functions as a service all at the same time. And that's what I'm gonna to demonstrate today. I've built out a demo where I'm gonna show you where console can help with this. So first let's look at exactly where console would fit to drive blue green deployment. And with console, there are three ways to do this. The first one is a feature called console template. Here we're gonna ask console to dynamically update a load balancers configuration based upon changes in my environment. The second one is a feature called console Terraform Sync. Here we're gonna be using events in console to trigger the execution of Terraform. For organizations that are already using Terraform today, this should be particularly interesting. And then finally, we've got console service mesh. Here we can natively handle HTTP traffic in a protocol aware manner. This is gonna allow us to forward traffic based upon HTTP headers or paths. So for today, I'm gonna to be demonstrating the first one, console template. So here's my high level diagram. I built out a front end service, which is gonna be serving web content to my users. In the middle, I've got an Nginx load balancer that I'm gonna be using as my network control point. And just underneath there, I've got console template. This is gonna be reacting to changes in the environment. And then it's gonna be dynamically writing and updating Nginx's configuration when it sees these changes. 
By doing this, I'm going to be able to intelligently make decisions about which payment service on the back end I send my traffic to. Let's take a look. <clears throat> so here's the demo that I've got for you today. In the bottom left-hand side, I have my front end service and it's really simple. All it's gonna do is read out which payment service it has access to. Up here in the top right, I've got console's dashboard. I've already got some services deployed. For example, console itself. I've got my front end, a load balancer, and then I've got payments blue. And down here in the bottom right, I've just got an output from Kubernetes API. So the first thing that you'll notice is that I don't have my payments green service. So off screen, I'm gonna start deploying my new payments API. And as we see that start to provision and initialize, we're gonna see as it comes up, it's gonna register into console's dashboard. Console's gonna be looking to check to see if it's healthy. And then it's gonna apply some metadata and some tags that we're gonna to use to query it later. Here we can see the payment service green has came up and console has marked it as green. Perfect. At this point, we've separated the deployment of our code from its release. I'm able to deploy both my new payment services and I'm able to do my validation without actually sending traffic there. So if we look down the left-hand side, my front end service still shows red. It's not able to contact anything. The reason for this is because console enables a zero trust security paradigm. And what I mean by this is all communications in console, as I have it configured today, are denied by default. So no matter where these services are deployed or which network they're deployed into, communication can't happen unless I've explicitly whitelisted it. So let's go ahead and do that. In console, we do this by configuring something called an intention. And here I'm gonna create a new rule that says my front end service can talk to my load balancer service. Now, once I create this rule, my front end is gonna start contacting its payments API. And we can see as soon as I create it, payments version one comes through. The important part of this rule is that it doesn't matter how many instances make up my front end or where they're deployed, or how many instances make up my load balancer or where they're deployed. It's always one rule. I'm just saying front end can talk to load balancer. Okay, so now our front end is showing payment service one, and we're gonna start our blue-green deployment. Although there's a few ways that you can do blue-green deployments, the way I'm gonna do it is gonna trigger a change within Nginx configuration via the key value store within console. So here I've got a directory for my payments app and I've got a key that I've configured called deployment strategy. And if I was to change the strategy from blue to green, as soon as I click save, console template, which is running right next to Nginx, is gonna notice that a change has taken place. It's gonna re-render the configuration and then it's gonna ask Nginx to reload that new configuration. Then with the new configuration, Nginx is gonna send all of my traffic to the green service. Let's give it a go. So as soon as I press save, you can see my front end, without interrupting any of my users or showing any more errors, is instantly moved over to the new payment service. Now, that's pretty confident doing it all in one go, but let's take a look at maybe a more, uh, a more controlled approach. So here I'm gonna take my deployment strategy to none, which is gonna configure Nginx to equally balance the traffic between both services. And then I might wanna put myself in a position where actually only one in five requests are gonna be going to my new service. So four out of five are gonna to go to blue, and then the fifth one is gonna to go to green. And that gives me this flexibility where I can introduce services at a much slower pace. Anyway, that's my demonstration. And that is how we can use console and console template to dynamically make networking changes in our environment. Thanks, Pete, over to you. Thanks, Jamie. That was a great uh, presentation and demo. So I'm just looking to see if we've got any questions in the Q&A. I think I saw Dave answer them. Yep, okay, thanks. 
So folks, um, if you do have any other questions, um, please drop them in the Q&A and we'll get to them as, as I do the closing out, I guess. Um, so thanks again, Jamie. Um, great, great presentation and demo. Um, folks, that brings us to the end of our session today. Um, but as I mentioned at the top of the call, we, this session was recorded. Um, so you'll get the link soon. You can go back and, and watch it again and pick up on anything you might have missed. And, and if you like what you learned today and, and want to learn more about the topic, um, I encourage you to visit our Learn pages, which you'll find at learn.hashicorp.com. There's lots of great stuff there to support what Jamie was just taking you through. So I'll just check one more time before we do close it out, if we do have any questions. Um, we do have a question here for both Jamie and, and, and David, if you can. Um, I, I guess it's a follow on from the last question. How is this different from Istio? If you're there still, Jamie. Um, yeah, sure. So Istio and Consul definitely have some overlap. What I've shown you today is really console service discovery and console's template, which is quite different from what Istio is doing. Istio is a service mesh and is usually confined only to within a Kubernetes or multiple Kubernetes clusters. What we've seen today could be equally applied to a number of different platforms. Okay, there's another question that's just popped in, Jamie. Um, what is Console Connect? Console Connect is the name of Console's service mesh. There we go. Thanks, folks. Uh, any other questions? Oh, we've, got a, we've got a thank you there for, for you, Jamie. Thank you. <laughs> um, folks, well, as I said, that, that brings us to the end of our session today. Uh, thanks so much for joining. I'm just going to check. Oh, there's quite a few more questions in here. Hang on. Oh, there's one more. Um, Jamie, thanks. Can Console work with AWS ALB? Yep, absolutely. So there's a number of ways that we can integrate with more native cloud services. Um, one that comes to mind is we could be using Terraform to programmatically program an ALB based upon um, changes the environment. Okay, hope that answers your question. Just checking to see if there's any other questions, whether there's any in chat. What is service mesh? I think we've answered that. Okay. Um, there's one here, I'm not sure if it's been answered. It's in chat, um, Jamie. What is native and ingress? Native is a project, it's a framework for executing functions as a service on Kubernetes. What we saw today wasn't really anything to do with that, but it's a pretty cool project. Ingress is, I suppose it's a general term for um, bringing traffic in from an external network to, in most examples, an internal Kubernetes network. Nice, okay. Um, and we've got a, another two questions, if you're okay. Um, can we run console within Nomad? If so, how do we configure it? The answer is yes, um, we absolutely can integrate a uh, console and Nomad. Here we use console as our dedicated scheduler and we use console to overlay a lot of the dynamic networking components associated with it. As far as the specifics on how we can configure it, I'm assuming Pete has some contact details with you and we can maybe link up some guides or some places to go and look, or if, if you prefer, we can have a conversation offline. Yeah, that's great. And folks, like I said, I'll be sending out an email out within the next couple of days with some links to further information as well as a link to the recording. Um, and if you do have any other questions, just reply back to me, um, ask me those questions. I'll speak with uh, Jamie and Dave and, uh, and ask them to get back to you. And it looks like Dave's answered a couple of questions in the background as well. There's one more um, question there, Pete. This is, um, when would you use console watch over console template? Uh, yes. Um, the answer is depending on where you're um, using your integration. So console template is going to require you to run a static binary that's going to be doing that watching for you. If you wanted a more native integration to directly do this sort of action, this watching action um, inside your application's 
code, then you could use just natively the watch APIs. Checking I'm not on mute. Okay, thanks for that, Jamie. And I think that's it for the questions. Can't see any more there. Just checking one last time. No, you're good. Okay, well, thanks again, Jamie. And, and thanks again to everyone um, for joining the call. Um, appreciate you, you, you hanging around to the end and also some really good questions. And as I said, if you do have any further questions, just reply to my email um, that, I, that I'll send out soon with the links. And, and we'll get back to you as soon as we could, uh, as soon as we can, rather. Okay, folks, well, that brings us to the end of our session today. Thanks very much again for joining. I hope to see you on the next snapshot. Thanks again, Jamie, and thank you, Dave, in the background there for answering those questions. Enjoy the rest of your day, and bye for now.